Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actress Brenda Wheel and writer, publisher, Patricia Nell Warren. Actress, activist, Brenda Wheel was born in Washington, D.C. But because her father was in the military, the family moved every year or so. One of the highlights of moving was two years in a French high school. She graduated from Barra College in Lake Forest, Illinois, and went on to earn a master's in speech and drama from uh, Catholic University back to her roots in D.C. <laughs> You've seen Brenda on TV in Law and & Order, Boston Legal, Chicago Hope, and her recurring roles on Party of Five, Malcolm in the Middle, and Jack and Bobby. She was a member of the prestigious Guthrie Theater Company, and for many years you acted there and on different stages, uh, Public Theater and Lincoln Center in New York, and Seattle Rep, just to name a few, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> We've covered everything but film. Have you been in film, too? I have. Very, very little bit of film, but I was in American Beauty. Oh, and, so that uh, was a big contender, it was a, it Oscar. Was <laughs> great. Well, we did, I didn't know it at the time. I knew it was a wonderful script, but yes. And a movie called Soldier with Kurt Russell. But you spent most of your time on the stage. But yes, that was what I was trained to do uh, originally. And, I, and I, it's a very different experience. Yeah, where um, did this acting begin? When you were in, at, at uh, Catholic University, did you want to be an actress? Well, by that time, yes. But I, well, I, my brother wanted me to be an actor. I ran away from it all the time, Joan, because it was just, it was one of those things that was terrifying to me. Was he in show business? Not at all. He's in the, oh. he's in the Defense <laughs> Intelligence Agency. But he wanted you to be an actress? <laughs> yes, I think he saw something that um, he really wanted to support. And it was a deep love of mine, but I was, I was afraid, really, afraid to do it. Well, you had never taken it, right? No, I was not a French in major. School, not in no, I never took any acting classes. So how did it happen? Mystery, I think. <laughs> Mystery. I feel it, it's a calling in a way. And uh, when you're invited to participate in something that you have a secret passion about, it's, it's, uh, you can't say no. Uh, so I discovered in doing it that I, I, I loved it. And it said something to me. And it said, you know what? The most interesting thing to me is it gathers people together. It, that's what Live everyone theater. says. The idea that you're in a theater alone right. at, and you're acting and people are actually there sharing something with you. That's exactly Do you right. feel that? Very much so. Uh, but well then, so. the calling came, but where did the calling come from? I don't know. It's <laughs> How'd you get mysteries. to the Guthrie? Well, the Guthrie, that was such an interesting story. I, uh, I had done one show at the Guthrie and they were changing over oh. to the new uh, artistic director. And that artistic director, with whom I'd never worked, said, would you come back? Well, I'd been there for five months in repertory. And I said, I wouldn't come back for five months because I had to take my children with me. And I said, but I'd come back for three to five years. Well, you can't do that in our union. They won't make that kind of Oh, contract. you said you'd come back for this long period of right. time. Right. I'd rather, I'd rather <laughs> move here, you know. So he said, well, I'll let you know. It took forever. Finally, he called. I went back to Philadelphia. He called and he said, would you join? I said, thank you so much. I would love to. He said, can you come next Monday? Oh. And I said, no, I can't. <laughs> and we went through this whole thing, but we ended up making a deal. I said, you know, Garland, I promise you that I will never ask you to, do, to leave. I was in a show at the time, leave the show. He wanted me to leave the show and come out. I said, I will never do what, to you what you're asking oh. me if you take me on. And he did. And I was there for 10 years. So you waited, finished your show in Philadelphia. Obviously, I, I thought the Guthrie was the beginning of your acting career. You had been acting. Well, regionally. This I was see. where I was living in Philadelphia. Oh, so you were just. Uh, right. And that was my first f foray out into at the Guthrie. I had lived there before and I thought, I'll never In Minneapolis? Never yeah. How could you the live Guthrie. there? <laughs> Well, my husband was head of the, some arts, um, pretty, state arts council. Pretty hard weather, right? I loved it, though. Oh, did you? Oh, my gosh, what a wonderful city. <laughs> yeah, it was cold, and it was hot and muggy. So we ended up professionally finishing what you should have been doing right. and then going 
and because of your professional attitude, you stayed there a long time. I did. It was did a you go gift. to different theaters in between? We, could you work at different places? You know, uh, late in the game, I could. It was such an intense schedule. We worked uh, nine months of the year, seven days, practically seven days. Doing away. what? Were you in training? Uh, no. We, well, we had training. The theater gave us training as well, but we were also, I would be in a show, I would be rehearsing a show, and I would be understudying a show all at the same time. Oh, so that was the kind of involvement right. when you're with a company? Exactly. Does it happen all the time? all? No, never anymore, I don't think. It's too expensive. And oh, oh, I see. Yeah. What about um, the theater as opposed to television? Do you see any similarities? Um, the similarities that I can find, and I haven't done that much of it, is that there is a community of people who create the show. Uh, uh, well, because so you've been on those shows that are, are what? long playing shows. Yes. So you go in and sometimes there's a host. You can feel that there's a, a host of the family. Oh, that's They're interesting. They're very open, very warm, very include, you know, in, in, including. And then other sets, I say sets because you don't feel that or you can feel the tensions or the discomfort. But um, I have never been on a long running show. Um, you know, where you go every day for years. But w what about the theater? Those are long runs, in a the, way. They're just more intimate. I don't know how else to describe it. Your rehearsal period, number one, which I love, that's what I love, is rehearsing with people. Does somebody take charge the same way you were talking about on a TV set? Is someone in the theater like, would you be the hostess? <laughs> yes, the stage manager, actually. Oh, that's it. The so, stage manager yeah, is. But yeah. you're almost an ambassador if you're in a company. Yeah. You know, you're an ambassador. So you've been on a lot of stages throughout the U.S. What are the difference in stages? Do you find difference in audiences or difference in the theaters? Both. Um, cities in which there has been a long history of um, theatrical performances mm -hmm. available to the um, citizens, it's a very different experience. They're wise. They're 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 smart. They know what they what they know what's good. They know what isn't good. Uh, other parts, you know, they're really into enter entertainment more than your audience. You yeah. can tell what. Yeah. And then what about the people working in those theaters? Do they all kind of reach a, the level? <laughs> um, they do really. They do. It's interesting. I, also, because you know, it's a very transient profession. I know. That's why. So, so you you meet other family members in other theaters that you have relationships with their family members in other theaters. Um, you know? Did you work in Europe at all? I did. I spent two years. Uh, I did a, a production of Peter Sellers, not Peter Sellers, the Pink Panther, but Peter, Peter Sellers, Sellers the, the genius the wunderkind, <laughs> you know, brilliant, brilliant Peter, Peter Sellers. <laughs> not to say the other one wasn't brilliant no, too, but exactly. both in their own way. I know exactly. Peter Sellers, the theater guy. He uh, he put together uh, this piece. It's from a Greek play. Well, it was the Greek play called The Children of Heracles, after oh. 911, and we went to oh, really? all over Europe, and we did this play. I was playing Demophon, who was the, the um, king in the play, but he didn't change any of the language, but I would be, in his view, uh, the contemporary president of the United States. That was behind the language for him. So every, all of us were in contemporary clothes, and we met with refugees in each of these countries, because it was about, the play is oh. about refugees. Oh, so They'd be on the stage with us. Is that right? Yes. Did, did you get to use your French? Because when you were in school in France, obviously you learned to speak French fluently. Yes. Well, we were in Paris, <laughs> and we got to use it there. And a number of the refugees, interestingly enough, in different parts of Africa, et cetera, they spoke French oh, as well. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So where did you find the, the refugees to come on stage? They, um, there was a person who worked with the production who went out in advance to these cities in Vienna and Barcelona and Paris and Amsterdam, et cetera. And you were in all those cities? Yes. Oh. Uh, and they would uh, pick from a group of refugees. And they would pick, so they were teenagers mostly, the uh, young oh. women and um, young boys, uh, to be in the piece. They had no, sp no language, mm. but they were physically present. And, uh, Could they understand the what you were talking about? Oh yes, about. they were. They had worked with them before we even got to the city. Uh, I think one of the most amazing, amazing evenings was in the Parliament in Vienna, in the Parliament, and statues all around were Hercules. And uh, oh. we used actually. I was standing in the box where you know uh, any prime minister, any president, anybody would speak from, and the refugees who were the refugees in that country, 
uh, were lying around on the in sleeping bags uh, around on. The and each country has a different uh, assortment of refugees, yes. don't they? Yes, they I do. mean, they tend to ha to go in groups, so exactly. there's different immigrants there and, exactly. or refugees or. We had very different uh, different combinations. Um, they tried to have them mixed everywhere. It wasn't always possible. I think when we were in Germany, uh, there were they were Turkish I, Kurds. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what I was thinking. And in uh, Spain, they would be from Eastern. Uh, yes. Well, we, Eastern had, we actually had a a mix in Spain. Did you? And sometimes, what was the city? I can't remember. There was a city in which it was hard to find them because they'd been so uh, integrated. In, yes. Which is not always the case. Which is bringing me to your activism, mm -hmm. Madre, mm -hmm. um, which is a, an organization that's 22 years old, yes. which is pretty amazing. Tell us a yes. little bit about it before we have to leave. Well, Madre is an organization that's based in New York, and it is in in the support. It exists in support of women and children and families around the globe in in war torn areas. It provides assistance for human rights assistance and medical assistance and shelters. And um, this particular event that we did w was earmarked towards women and children in Iraq. And oh, since I the see. occupation in Iraq, women have been uh, threatened and children and families have been threatened, needless it's, to say. It's hard to ask you why you got involved because hearing your background with Peter Sellers and going mm -hmm. through Europe and talking to immigrants, it seems like a natural fit. Uh, have you ever produced or directed before? Um, not really. I've <laughs> did, no, no, I haven't. I look forward to doing more. But I will say this, Joan. I'm, I, I, two years ago, I had my New Year's resolution was do something about something. And this is. And uh, it's there's so much to do. And yesterday, seeing Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, um, which everyone must see, I thought the man is doing something about something. It's just starting it. Just starting to do something. I. But somebody called you. How did you get involved in Madre? Because you did your fundraiser in Los Angeles, and you say right. it's a New York-based organization. I was in New York. I'm in New York some of the time because I perform there as well. And I saw the first benefit of this Baghdad burning uh -huh. uh, at the um, knitting factory. Oh. And a friend of mine did it, put it together with her friend Liz Magnus, who is the composer. She composed a piece for this benefit. They, uh, the benefit was the reading of Baghdad is Burning by Riverbend, who is an Iraqi, anonymous Iraqi young woman who's been blogging oh. since the invasion. So you're picking up So she from put that. the pieces together. We did readings of those. We had wonderful generosity in this city. Everyone wanted to participate. And uh, fantastic. Tyne Daly and Amy Brenneman and Ann Cusack and uh, Jenna Fisher and that was just wonderful talents. Wonderful people in the city gave food and drink and um, isn't it amazing uh, how you can get together that is what i was talking about producing because you were chairing it and getting it all together yes, which was <laughs> a lot <laughs> <That's> a <right. laughs> lot but anyone who's interested in madre they could just go online to www.madre.org or because and learn it's or, more because yeah. it's uh, i would like to set up LA friends of Madre That's here in great. Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Thank Brenda. Thank you, Joan. And don't go away. We'll be right back with our uh, publisher, author, Patricia Nell Warren. Comcast. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm with publisher, novelist, writer, athlete, I have a multi, multi hyphenate, Patricia Nell Warren, who was born and raised on a historic southwestern Montana cattle ranch. I was a cowgirl on a horse, she tells me, and also a bookworm. She graduated from Manhattanville College of the Sacred Heart uh, with a Bachelor of Arts in English. And where does the cowgirl with a Bachelor of Arts in English go <laughs> when she finishes school? Well, the cowgirl was in shock when she arrived in New York City. <laughs> was she? <laughs> <laughs> Did the typical thing of <laughs> the tall buildings. I loved <laughs> it when you said, I was raised on a horse. <laughs> well, I literally, I was. Uh, we were a working ranch, and uh, all the kids worked. Uh, we helped. We were part of the operation, and we were also expected to do our homework and stuff. 
So growing up with books the way I did and a family that really appreciated uh, education and publishing and information and history, it was just a natural thing for me to think about going into publishing. But you didn't, you, you didn't, your family didn't own the ranch. Or oh, did they own oh, the ranch? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, they, they did the ranch. own the ranch. Yes. yes, they did. Oh, because when I, when I <clears throat> thought it was a historic ranch, I thought it belonged to, you know, like... That was later on. Oh, is later that what on. happened? Okay. The ranch had been in the family for four generations since my great-grandparents came out to Montana in the 1860s. Ah. And so my dad was the most recent generation, and my brother and I loved the ranch and, you know, loved everything about agriculture and and the environment and, and the sun and the grass and the animals and everything, but we really wanted to do other things with our lives. So my brother became a pilot and an engineer, and I had wanted to be a writer ever since I was 10 years old. Oh, is that right? Yes, so. But you were in the rodeo and you were. Uh, I rodeoed a little when <laughs> I was a kid. But it was just really, um, it really important for me to do, to go where my heart really wanted to go, and that was to be a storyteller and to go out there and tell the stories. And that would certainly include stories about the ranch. So after college, after you college, knew where I to go. To, that's right. <laughs> and there I am in New York, and at that time it was the center of the media world. And um, I applied to different places, right. and I got a job at the Reader's Digest. So later on, when my parents, when my dad retired from ranching, because it was a historic ranch, right. the National Park Service That's bought the ranch and they turned it into a National Historic Site. Is that yes. how it happened? That, that's so right. So after four generations in your family. That's right. But it is still preserved. It's, it's all like still there. Literally, when you go there, it's the Grant Coors Ranch National Historic Site at Deer Lodge, Montana. They have a website that people can go look at. But what you see there is not a restoration. It is all the original stuff. Your house. The house. The contents of the house, the bunk, the dishes in the bunkhouse, the old chaps really? hanging on the wall, the old buggies, the old wagons, the harness, that everything is the original stuff that was always there. Do you go back to visit? I do. I do. do does it, is it real nostalgic? I bet it's great. Well, I think it's wonderful that it's still there so that people <coughs> can go there and get an idea of what the life was really like versus what they see in the movies and television. Well, how did that affect your writing? Because as you were working at the Reader's Digest, you were writing as well. Right. I think, did you work yourself up through the ranks? I started as a copy editor. I did that for five years, and that gave me a great opportunity to learn about printing and production oh, and how the whole process comes together. And then I got, um, I got myself raided into the book department. <laughs> and because I had <coughs> always been grown up in a family that was so interested in history, uh, I worked on a lot of projects that had to do with history and originating books and then working on other people's projects with their authors. Were you writing at the same time for yeah, yourself? Yeah, I, I was you know, <laughs> on my lunch hours and at home. I did a lot of writing. And yet, were you writing novels at the time? Poetry, short stories, oh, novels, uh, all kinds of stuff during those years. And you were also a marathon runner. Was that during that yes. time too? That started in 1968 on a dare, a friend of mine at the Digest and, and I got started jogging and we dragged our, <coughs> I was married at the time, dragged our husbands into it and we were going to train for a year on a dare. Oh, I and, see. And get good enough <coughs> to run in the Boston Marathon the following year. And that which, was- Which you did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> so we call you an athlete from the rodeo to the marathon. <laughs> right. And then talking about your husband and the poetry that you were mm -hmm. writing at the time, he was a, you a Ukrainian artist. That's right. He was a Ukrainian emigre. His family had come to the United States along with many other hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees after the Second World War, people who did not want to leave under communism. So they left and came here and he was a poet and he was part of a whole group of young poets and writers. And oh, because I bet so there was a very artistic there group was who had come to New big York group at the time. and very, very close. And my in-laws and most of my friends didn't speak very much <coughs> English, so I had to learn the language. Oh, you did? And that was, there was the moment when I thought to myself, well, I should try my hand at writing poetry in Ukrainian. Which you did? Which I did. And but I did was, he write poetry too? Yes. Oh, yes. and then you published it. The whole it. group. So we started, <laughs> that was actually my first involvement with independent publishing. We started a little publishing co-op called the New York Group, oh, New York oh. Skarhupa, and we published a poetry annual and pooled our funds, and then we helped each other publish our own books and distribute them to 
Slavic departments and oh, Ukrainian press in, in, in uh, Canada and the United States. You, you talk about um, independent and non-independent publishers. What are the differences mm -hmm. in those? Uh, Basically, things? an independent publisher is not owned by somebody else. Uh, um, for example, <coughs> when... So were you an independent publisher? Yes. Uh, well, we were certainly <coughs> independent because we funded our own thing and, and did it ourselves. Uh, when I published uh, The Front Runner, which is my best known book, I, it was with William Morrow. And at that time, that. yeah, that's the book. Um, that's not the Morrow edition. But at that time, <coughs> William Morrow was the last of the really big trade houses in the United States that was not owned by someone else. It oh, was still an independent, self-owned company. Then <coughs> later on, they were bought up by a big corporation. And now they're all owned uh, by big corporations. And the front runner was, or is, a big bestseller. It was on the New York um, right. book review on the, on the list of, of uh, bestsellers. Was this writing this influenced from the ranch time or the marathon time? I think there's a little bit of all of that. There are a lot of military in my family. Oh. So the, the main <coughs> character is an ex-Marine. So there was a lot of my my knowledge of my family members who had served in the armed forces who were in there, the sort of sensibilities of, of the characters, and then the whole athletic and sports world, which I had been in, which very what, much right. influenced because this is set in the... Uh, track and field and preparation for the Olympic Games in the 1970s. But this was in the 70s. Yes. And it was a breakthrough because it addressed the problems of, uh, the problems of a gay athlete. Right. So how did you have the courage to write that kind of character in at that point? It was pretty scary. <laughs> was it? Uh, you know, the Stonewall <laughs> had just happened in mm -hmm. 1969. The good thing was that the publishing industry at that time was realizing that gay books would sell. There was beginning to be interest and curiosity and so they were looking for books at this time and so I came along at the right time with this book and it was it was bought by William Morrow and published in 1974. And then uh, it was translated into how many different many countries? Languages. languages. Ten, ten different we languages. the Spanish one here. That's right. That's the Spanish uh, just came out, El Corredor de Fondo. Uh, in Spain, it's been out in French and German, al almost all the European languages, Japanese, it's amazing. Latvian. And you actually then started your own publishing company with a friend. Uh, the company's called Wildcat. Wildcat Press. So how did you have <laughs> enough courage to do that? Well, there are a lot of issues in publishing um, around creative control for <laughs> authors. Some of the same issues that you see with, with, with m m music artists in the music business around control of your material and uh, money and royalties and accountability and stuff like that. And also in the film business with the whole independent film studio movement. So there are similar issues in book publishing for authors. And there was the moment when um, Tyler St. Mark, who was my publicist at the time, uh. um, I was having some difficulties with some of the trade publishers that I was with at that time and issues around contracts and money and so forth. And we came up with this idea that we would start our own independent publishing company and that I would go through a process of trying to get all my rights back that were already out oh, there to get them reverted or to get the licenses. And then all the new material that I would write from that point <laughs> on would be published by Wildcat Press. So is it just for you? Yes. Is it a press just for you? It's like a you? private imprint. Oh, that's very right. interesting. Right. So we have uh, 10 titles in print, and I'm working. I have a new book in the works right now. Tell me those. What about film rights? Are we, are we talking about any of these going being films? Well, the, fr the front runner has become talking. notorious. The front runner, yes. because Brokeback Mountain yes. <laughs> kind of went into the film. <laughs> but it had the same kind of uh, feeling, didn't it? Yes. It, it, it's, it's a kind of story. First of all, it's a love story like Brokeback Mountain. It's uh, a story that's going to require a bigger budget than a lot of gay films, um, which tend to be low-budget films. I see. So The Front Runner has been notoriously around Hollywood for 30 years, and different people have taken stabs at it. And probably now with Brokeback Mountain, we're in a time where people will actually be willing to spend the money yeah, and to maybe. do the right thing <laughs> for the story. And, and while you're waiting for that, you're searching for Amelia Earhart. searching for Amelia <laughs> Earhart. 
And why <laughs> Amelia? Well, like everybody who's looking to get into the film business, I have my slate yes. of, of <laughs> projects and things that I'm interested in. And um, she's always been a personal, I have my, my short list of, of favorite women heroes and, and favorite women great people. And uh, I've always admired her and because of the, the pilots in my family. I've been interested oh, in, I, in, yeah. in aviation. And, uh, but I ran across, uh, there are all these different groups of people who are looking for the wreckage of the airplane. Mm. This is the thing. She Do you think went, they'll find it? Uh, I think so. I definitely think they will. There are the different theories about where and how she went down and disappeared somewhere in the South Pacific in 1937 with her navigator. And uh, I'm working with a, an Australian group Oh. who um, <coughs> have actually documented reports of the finding of a old airplane wreck that was a civilian plane right at the end of World War II. It's actually reported in military records. And it obviously we had been there for a while, civilian airplane, it's every chance that it's her plane. How could you tell for sure? You don't have DNA on planes, but there must be some other kind of things that would... People who are involved in these search and recovery efforts for military aircraft, that, that it's amazing how much you can still find after 75 years. Under the right conditions, you will find the tail number. You oh, will find really? there are certain, med certain things about the plane that will tell you engine serial numbers and so forth and even with the with the human remains there will be large bones and things like oh, that that you are still oh I see. there's an enormous search and recovery effort for World War II people plane crews especially missing in action thousands of them from World oh, War II I see. and so this Australian group has been involved in this ever so, so they know what they're doing they by know, yes. looking for planes and, and that are downed in the jungle have been there a long time and now and then they find uh, a B-17 bomber or, or B-21 bomber and, and then, you know, 75 years later, the crews or remains come back to their oh, families wow. and their families get closure after 75 oh, years. Oh, that's fabulous. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's great. And I just appreciate so much that you came on and enlightened us from the airplanes to the ranch <laughs> to publishing. Thank you, Patricia. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed thank talking you. with you. And she's been such a great person. She talks at colleges. She speaks at libraries. She's been awarded. She's in the Cowboy Hall of Fame. She's in the Gay and Lesbian Literary uh, Hall of Fame. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, Los Angeles 90017. We'll see you next time. <laughs>